Good morning. There's one thing I've learned in 20 years of ministry is when the musician says it's go time, it's go time. <laughs> so welcome to worship at Sarah Memorial United Church on this beautiful July Sunday. My name is Reverend Renee Clark, and I normally serve as the spiritual care liaison for Northwood Long-Term Care, but I'm delighted to be back to join you for worship for the next three Sundays and two Sundays in August, as we continue along with a sermon series called Real Theology, where we'll examine theological themes found in films and look at how they apply to our Christian lives today. As we begin worship, we light the Christ candle as a symbol of the light that came into the world, more fully revealed in Jesus Christ, a light that shines in the darkness, such that the darkness will not overcome it. And we light the pride candle as a statement that all people are valued and welcome here, and we celebrate diversity in all of its beautiful forms. As we gather this morning, we also pause to acknowledge that in this region, we live and work and worship on land that is the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. May we thus live with respect on that land and at peace with its people. Our opening song this morning is uh, Spirit of Life, which is 381 and Voices United. And if I remember correctly from the last time I was here, the words will also appear on the screens. No? Yes. yes.
Our opening prayer is in unison. You'll find that in your bulletins as well. Gracious God, we name this as an opening prayer. To call it an opening prayer suggests it's an opening into something more. An opening of the door into this time. And we ask your blessing. Nurture our faith and our trust in the fullness of your gifts. Open doors of security and reveal to us the fruit filled with life, life, hope, and promise. A life that you might be called a journey of discipleship as followers of Jesus. We turn to you knowing, knowing that, that you understand us, forgive us, us and love us like a mother. And, and so we pray with confidence and faith. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, us this day our daily bread, and forgive us, us our trespasses, and as we give you the those who trespass against us. And he does not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In the gospel reading we're going to hear in a few moments, Jesus talks to us about how to be in the world and uses two things that are pretty common, salt and light. Two things for which there are no substitutes. Any of you who bake know that sugar and salt look quite a bit alike, but they are not interchangeable. Sugar looks a lot like salt until you try to put it on your french fries. Yeah. Um, and when you're trying to find your way around in a dark space, you can rope and guess and feel your way around and sort of make a go at it with your other senses. Or you can turn on the light, which is much more effective. Salt and light are two things that we really need to be what they are. There's nothing about salt that makes it especially special. Salt is just being salt, doing what it's meant to be. And candles do much the same thing. They shine light. They do what it is they're meant to do. But there is no substitute for either salt or light. Those are things that fulfill their functions like nothing else can. And Jesus says the same thing to us, that being who we are, being in the world as God made us to be, gives light and life and saltiness to the world. And through our scriptures this morning and linking it to today's film of the grand seduction, we're going to spend the next little while pulling up our just what that means. Our scriptures for today are Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, and Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. You, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. From Philippians. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. 
in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being in found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thanks be to God. This summer, there's a new musical playing in Charlottetown by musician Alan Doyle called Telltale Harbor. It's yet another adaptation of what was first a French Canadian film and then a movie uh, filmed in Newfoundland about nine years ago called The Grand Seduction. And it was on Netflix until the end of June. I didn't realize it would be leaving Netflix when I chose it for us. But it is still on one of the Amazon Prime Superstations and on Apple TV. Have any of you seen the movie? <gasps> Excellent. It is. It is. It's worth seeing. Two votes for the grand seduction. Yes. <laughs> the appeal for me is definitely there. My first two pastorates were small fishing villages, not unlike the one in the movie. My grandmother was from Newfoundland depression that seemed to beat the men down when they were no longer able to provide for their families in the way they always had. And it's that story that the grand seduction attempts to tell. In the opening scenes of the movie, taken from his childhood in the 1950s, the main character, Murray French, who is played absolutely brilliantly by an Irishman, Brendan Gleeson, says this, when I was a boy, Tickle Head was a proud fishing harbor. Back then, people from Tickle Head were strong, dignified, and brave. Their days were filled with purpose. By no means was this life for the faint of heart, the weak, or the lazy. As I look back now, I can truly say that life was a thing of beauty. And so the story begins with our main character, Murray French, as a young boy, narrating about his father, who was one of the fishermen in the small community of Tickleheadland. Murray felt then that the community had a sense of purpose and an ethic of hard work, and noted the, what we tend to think of now as that 1950s domestic bliss. And then the storyline fast, forward, fast forwards to the early 90s with lineups at the town post office of the men receiving welfare checks from the post office clerk Kathleen and walking down the road to catch, cash them with the bank, man, bank manager Henry Tilly, who's played by the inimitable Mark Critch. Adding to the indignity, Marie's wife decides that she needs to leave him for a job at a recycling plant in St. John's. At a town meeting, the mayor tells Murray that a petrochemical factory is being negotiated for the town, but the company requires that there be a doctor resident there for the factory to come. And the community has been trying unsuccessfully for eight years to recruit a doctor. Now in Nova Scotia, we know a little bit about what it is to recruit a doctor. We can relate to this as well. And Murray resolves that the factory and the doctor that they need to get the factory are going to be the solution to all of his troubles. He gets his hopes up and then he sees the mayor leaving town with his family to go to a job in St. John's as well. The storyline takes us to the St. John's airport where Dr. Paul Lewis, a plastic surgeon is flying home to LA after having been part of a winning team in a cricket competition. And the security officer finds cocaine in his luggage. The security officer is none other than the former mayor of Ticklehead, who makes a deal with him. In exchange for overlooking the cocaine in the suitcase, 
Dr. Lewis agrees to live in the town of Ticklehead for one month. They think that's long enough to get the factory nailed down. And so Murray arranges for the seduction of Dr. Lewis to a long-term contract, lying to the townspeople, telling them that this will guarantee the choice of Ticklehead as the location for the new factory. And as part of this ruse, he convinces the townspeople to pretend to play cricket, which is the doctor's favorite sport. He has some of the women of the village bug the landline at the house where Dr. Lewis is staying. So they will learn more about what he likes and come up with more ways to entice him to stay. The executive of the petrochemical company visits the town and tells Murray posing as the mayor that the rival town of St. Anne has made a more attractive offer that includes a $100,000 bribe. The executive demands that he too receive a bribe before the plant could be considered to be awarded to Ticklehead and expresses concern that the population of Ticklehead seems to be too small to staff this factory. Henry's bank denies the bank loan. There's no declared purpose for it, of course. And when Henry presses the issue, the bank managers tell him that he could be replaced with an ATM. So, so Henry goes rogue. He approves the loan anyway, against the bank's instructions, knowing that it's going to cost him his job. And all of the efforts that the townspeople make do persuade Dr. Lewis to stay, helped by the discovery that his fiance has been cheating on him with his best friend. But when he accepts the position in front of the whole town in a speech praising their authenticity and their integrity, Murray lies. He feels guilty. So he tells Dr. Lewis that another doctor has already accepted the position and they don't need him after all. Kathleen, the postmistress, tells Dr. Lewis the truth, revealing all the deceptions, causing him to angrily confront Murray just as the executive is there to sign the paperwork for the factory. And after an impassioned speech by Murray, the doctor agrees to stay and the company agrees to build the factory. The film rolls ahead to the period of time when the factory has opened and brought dignity to the town again. Murray is reunited with his wife. There's a job for Henry, who has in fact been replaced by an ATM. And the film ends with this same sort of satisfied feeling as Murray's opening flashback, where the village has secured its future with the economic engine of the petrochemical factory. That's the movie in a nutshell. A few moments ago, I said that the story had a broader appeal for me than just the regional one beyond the beautiful Newfoundland scenery, beyond the fascinating accents, beyond the story of ingenuity and adversity. And that appeal for me lies in the carryover in the life of the church and what I've seen play out time and time again as I've lived and served in congregations throughout Nova Scotia. The parallels are rich. At least they are in the Baptist world, and I can't imagine the United world is so much different. 50, 60 years ago, just like the cod fishery was going great guns, our Baptist churches were bursting at the seams. We were building churches like Mulgrave Park in the north end of Halifax and Bayers Road in the west end of Halifax, born out of an optimism for the future sustained by the successes of the past. The baby boomers were children whose parents were deeply committed to these new congregations. The church was the center of society. But like the burgeoning cod fishery, that eventually went bust. It was not to be forever. Along came competition, the need to work on Sunday, the opportunity to shop on Sunday, the desire to participate in organized activities like sports, the uprising in all kinds of interests that surpassed the commitment to congregational life. So in just about the same 50 or 60 years that the cod fishery declined, the church changed so much that those who ventured into those new and growing neighborhoods to plant new and growing churches might not even recognize them. I think as a church, we see ourselves in the desperation of the people of Ticklehead. They turn themselves inside out trying to attract the new young doctor. They want him to stay, badly. And so they try to determine what it is that they could be that would make him like them and feel like he belonged, that would make him want to call Ticklehead home. And they try. 
They try really, really hard. They create a cricket team. They plant money on the dock. They take him fishing and send a diver down to attach a giant codfish to his line. They ask the postmistress to flirt with him. These are some of the funniest scenes in the movie. And as we watch them, we laugh. But there's a part of those proceedings that gives me more than a little twinge. In an attempt to make church relevant to a new generation, what sorts of things have we tried? There are churches that now meet in movie theaters. There are churches who've gone to worship bands. There are some that have added coffee shops that have encouraged a come as you are approach that live stream events from mega churches and big name preachers. But do those things work? Are those the things that will save the village? Those are not necessarily the things that Jesus is asking of us. They're not bad things. Not at all. He doesn't call us, though, to be what the world wants, but what the world needs and who we genuinely are. In the passage from the Sermon on the Mount that I want us to look at today, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. What this is for us is a call to authenticity, to let our light shine. Not the light that we think people might want to see. Not the light that we see others shining that might work, but our own light. Looking at the scriptures, we think of people like Abraham and Moses and Elijah and David and Paul and John and Peter as those guys. You know, those guys who have lights to shine. But did they start off that way? Yeah, when you look at their life stories, at least what we know of their life stories, it's not necessarily the case. What they were was willing. Willing to let the Lord direct their lives. And in that way, be used to accomplish great things. God took that raw material of willingness and multiplied it over and over and over again. The same is true for us. We've been given talent. We've been made who we are for a reason. But what's most important? With eternity stretching before us, what little we've made here doesn't count for much. Jesus tells us that the things that really matter are the investments we make in the kingdom of God. Those are the things that endure forever and ever. The scriptures tell us that to whom much is given, much is expected. But what about the rest of us who aren't quite sure we can live up to standards like that? You know, us, the Murray Frenches of the world, the everyday folks. We can breathe a little easier and feel a little more comfortable with the ones who seem to be on our level. I don't know about you, but I always find those Bible characters that are a little less talented, a little more relatable. You know, maybe Andrew. Yes, he's always playing second fiddle to Peter. He must have gotten tired of that, getting introduced all the time as Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. But these are the people who aren't in the spotlight. The people who don't always do the things that get noticed but they are the people that do the things that matter. The small things, the unseen things that together make up the great things. It's important for us to remember that, that it's not about being the spotlight, but about being the collective lights that shine. Many smaller lights being as bright as one bigger light. If everybody was a soloist, we wouldn't have the parts blending together and harmonizing. When we take what we have, we take our light, whatever it is, and let that shine forward in the kingdom of God, God takes that and multiplies it and makes it even brighter. What makes up that light? Our light is made up of our talents as the abilities that God gives us and our gifts and talents that we develop as we grow in our walk with Christ, our willingness our, our willingness to step up and say, here I am, Lord, send me. 
I see this thing that needs to be done and I'm going to do it. God takes Abraham and makes him into a leader. God takes Moses and makes him into a deliverer. God takes a fisherman named Peter and turns him into a preacher. But what about the rest of us? When we see our village as we knew it collapsing around us and think there's nothing we can do about it. Think about that widow that had only a mite to give. Jesus stood back and watched her as she dropped her coin in the offering plate. And he pointed her out as, as an example. He said her gift is the greatest because she's given all she has. You think of the leper who was healed with the nine others. He didn't have a whole lot of theological insight into the things of God. But what he could do was to come back and say to the master, thank you. Thank you for healing me. Think of the blind man who received his sight and was called in front of the Sanhedrin to give an explanation of what happened. He couldn't explain it. He simply said, all I know is that once I was blind and now I can see. And he took that story and he went forward with it. God takes what we have and what we're willing to do, what we're willing to give and multiplies that. When you sit out on a summer evening and you look at the stars, I don't know one constellation from another, but I understand that when you do, you see a, a brilliance and a symmetry beyond imagination. When you realize that a star is much more than just a twinkling little light. And when God looks at us, I think what God sees is potential beyond our imagination. I'm convinced of that. In every one of us, he sees a light that can shine with a brilliance that will let the world know that he is the most precious kind of love there is. And thus, that lifts our lives to a whole new level of meaning. You are the light of the world. Hard words to embrace, perhaps fitting of Jesus, but us? We live in a world where there seems to be plenty of darkness around us and perhaps even within us. All too often, we might not feel like shining or like even if we do, it will amount to much. And yet the words that are spoken in our scriptures today are spoken by Christ to ordinary people who had simply encountered him and begun to follow him. They were as surprised as we are. It's not the popular or the powerful within the culture. It's the ones who are willing to bear a light to enlighten the world. It's not about obligation. It's not about having a product we have to have to sell or using people to fulfill a need or a burden we have. It's not about closing the deal in the way that Murray was trying to do it. It's not about the call of God in our lives being a burden. What did, when did Christ send his followers out to share anything other than what they had discovered for themselves? He asked them to share what they knew and what they had experienced. Jesus made it simple. What he said to them was, go tell your story. There's a lot more that can be involved. I know, I know that's a real simplification. But it's what we're called to. It's the truth and the hope that we have, recognizing that our story relates to the larger story of God. That's what Marie French was missing. This was not about convincing Dr. Paul that Ticklehead was the best place on earth, but sharing why it was the best place for him. About identifying what it was that Dr. Lewis needed and realizing that those needs could be met at Tickle Cove. We know that what drove Murray to desperation was that he saw his world crumbling. He saw a solution and he was desperate to make it happen. Whether it was what was best for Dr. Paul or not. In most of the movie, Murray is looking out for number one. And who wouldn't in his circumstances? But our text from Philippians this morning challenges us to question our motivations. It says, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. A little bit further on in Philippians, we read about Timothy. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare, for everyone looks out for his own interests and not those of Jesus Christ. 
That's not what the world of today tells us. Don't we need to seek our own interests? After all, who else is going to? There are only so many demands we can allow on our time, only so many thoughts we can fit in our brains. And doesn't the Lord command us to provide for our own households? Yeah. But there's a subtlety in that verse that often gets missed. It says, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. We're commanded, not just requested, to look after each other. The Greek word for look means we're to observe and contemplate each other's interests. So Paul tells us to do two things that also fit in with our story. First, that we're not to be so exclusively preoccupied with our own concerns and cares. We're not to think and act as though the whole universe revolves around us. But we are to be genuinely concerned about the life and interests of those around us. We are called to be other-centered. And as a congregation working with an interim minister to plan for your future, I know you've been doing a lot of that. That report that's been prepared that shows up on the front page of your website, and I had a look at that report last night, it clearly shows the amount of work you've put in. The groundwork, the excellent groundwork that's being laid for where your ministry is going. And a lot of that groundwork has come out of your working hard to understand what is not what you need, but what is needed around you. Not what you need, but what this neighborhood needs and how God can use you to meet those needs right here in North Dartmouth. And I commend you for that. What we do on Sunday mornings is not necessarily going to be the thing that brings people to Christ. What we wanna do is build people up so that when they're distributed, when we go from here and we fan out into our day-to-day -day lives, our lives speak for themselves. Our priorities and the way we live and love in the world speaks to the God that we, we know and serve. The way we live our lives is what lends credibility to our words. Not that any of us lives perfectly, none of us does, but we can live lives that reflect the gospel. Jesus says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. We are, in essence, billboards for God. The confirming echo of our witness. As a boy, Robert Louis Stevenson was intrigued by the work of the old lamplighter who went out with a ladder and a torch, setting the streetlights ablaze for the night. One night in Edinburgh, Scotland, as young Robert stood watching with childish fascination, his parents heard him exclaim, look, there's a man out there punching holes in the darkness. That is what the grand seduction is all about. That is what the scriptures for today are all about. Getting outside ourselves and our needs enough to recognize the needs all around us and how God can use us to meet them. So on this second Sunday in July, when we're finished here, let's go out there and punch some holes in that darkness.
our hymn is number 582, There's a Spirit in the Air. turn over to the words of a new creed which is either in the hymn books or on the screens if you prefer we are not alone we live in god's world we believe in god who has created and is creating who has come in jesus the word made flesh to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the spirit we trust in god we are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Minute for Mission. Behind every act of generosity, there's a story. Those who work in the United Church's philanthropy unit have the privilege of hearing these stories from generous supporters. Sometimes the story involves honoring someone significant through a gift. Other times it's responding to a deep internal impulse to create positive change in the world. Each story is inspiring. But this note included in a check sent by Rock Lake Pastoral Charge in Manitoba is especially delightful. Please find enclosed our check for $125.
one of our members' great-grandchildren rolled loose coins they found around the house. There was one roll of loonies, six rolls of quarters, six rolls of dimes, and five rolls of nickels. The three children, age 12, 9, and 7, were told that if they rolled the coins, they could use some money however they wanted. They decided very quickly that they wanted to give it to the children and people of Ukraine. They brought the money to Rock Lake Pastoral Charge and asked to have the money sent through the United Church of Canada for emergency response Ukraine. They wanted it to go through the church because their great grandmother loved the church. This story represents thoughtful, intentional giving at its finest. The children could have gone and bought a toy or a chocolate bar, but they thought about it and decided to give it to help people in Ukraine. They were so proud when they came into the office. It was a big, heavy bag of coins. Then they carried them for seven or eight blocks to get here. They were really pleased to present it, said the office administrator, Linda Sharp. Every gift given is a treasure. Every gift given tells a story about generosity. Thank you for supporting the work that we do together as a united church. May the story we tell in our giving and receiving bring us ever more near the heart of God. Amen. Thank you. Our scriptures today invite us to give of ourselves, to be a light, to meet the needs of others where they are. And doing that requires giving of all sorts, of time, of talent, and of treasure. Not just one of those, but all of them. The offering box was at the back. If you missed it on the way in, there are also offering plates at either entrance on the way out. Our offering hymn is Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow, number 541. Let us pray. God, you are a God of compassion and love. Time after time, we have experienced your care and provision. Time after time, you have answered our prayers and met our needs, often in ways we would not have dreamed possible. We praise you for your faithful love toward us as we offer a portion of the gifts we've been given. Because we've known your love, we come with confidence offering our gifts and our prayers for the world that you love, that it and those around us might come to a deeper knowledge of your love and grace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Someone hit the step. Say what? <laughs> Any way you like. God will use it wherever we put it down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you may be seated and we'll come before God in prayer. <laughs> Gracious God, we give thanks for the love that shines in Jesus, revealing to us your holiness and our righteousness in it. We recognize that there is a gap between what we are and what you are. But we rejoice that you chase the darkness that keeps it hidden from our eyes. 
In your light, we are encouraged. We are reassured to see your face turned in our direction, bidding us to come to you. We thank you, God, for your light in the world. Even though we've not always heeded your summons to become it. Yet we long to do your will. We ask forgiveness when we need it. Not merely for the things we've denied ourselves, but those things we've denied others. And we ask that you keep before us the needs of the world around us. The world into which you sent your son. The world into which you send us. Your world in which we are called to be your light in the darkness. Your voice in the wilderness. Your hope for the hopeless. Your strength sustains us in our weakness, offers us peace and gentleness, courage and boldness to proclaim more of you and of us less. We listen, God, for your word and ask that it will illumine our minds, that we might will as Jesus did, that our spirits might quicken to love as Jesus loved, that our steps might go where Jesus would go. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Our next hymn is number 12 in more voices. Come touch our hearts. Another new one for me. Touch our hearts that we may know compassion from falling embers build a blazing fire. Love strong enough to overturn injustice, to speak a world more gracious. Come touch and bless our hearts. Our souls that we may know and love you, your quiet presence, all our fears dispel. Create a space for spirit to grow in us. Let life and beauty fill us. Come touch and bless our souls. That is sermon and prayer and benediction all in one piece of music, isn't it? It's, it really is. 
Yeah, absolutely. May this journey open you to fresh discoveries of joy in God, draw you deep into the mystery with reverence, bind you more closely together, widen your welcome of others, strengthen your faith, and renew in you the courageous spirit of service. For Christ's sake, for who came into the world and for whom we go out into the world. Amen. Our song of dismissal is You Shall Go Out With Joy, number 684, 884. Go out with joy, be let